Every so often in large-scale trains, a product comes along that changes the playing field. Such is the case with the train engineer revolution from Aristocraft put out under their crest name. This is the newest generation of their remote control. With all the interest in the train engineer revolution, we thought we would create a video that shows exactly what you get in the starter kit. Inside, you will find everything that you need to install remote control in one engine. The receiver is designed to plug directly into any Aristocraft engine with the plug and play adapter, but it also includes an adapter plug that lets you use the receiver with any non-Aristocraft engine. So buying this kit, you're ready to go whether you have Aristocraft engines or not. The kit also includes a special board that allows you to control your smoke units as they draw higher power. The transmitter is completely redesigned, and one nice part is the screen is backlit so it's easy to read outside. The kit also includes a CD. There's no printed manual, but the CD has the instruction manual on it, along with several other documents that will help you learn how to install your Train Engineer Revolution into different products. Along with the CD is some paperwork. It's a quick start guide for those of you who don't want to take the CD, print out a manual. It's enough information to get you going, as well as a letter from Lewis Polk. On the letter, you might find a sentence there that says the train engineer has a six-month warranty. That's a typo. The unit actually has a five-year warranty. Let's take a look at the train engineer receiver. You get one of these inside the starter kit. This unit is specifically designed to plug directly in to the plug-and-play DCC RCC equipped locomotives from Aristocraft. You can see the unit has a 10-pin header as well as a 12-pin header. There's a small wire for the antenna and a large heat sink. There are several connectors on the board and we'll show you what those are used for in just a minute. Here's a close-up of the 10-pin support header and on the other side of the board is the 12-pin DCC RCC control header that will plug into your plug-and-play equipped Aristocraft locomotives. The manual has detailed drawings that will explain each part of the boards that are included with your kit. At the one end of the board, you will find the auxiliary connector, the remote link switch connector, and the link switch. You press the link switch to allow the receiver and the transmitter to link together. There's a link button on the board, but you won't be able to get to that once you install it inside your engine. So you use this extension cable to put the button somewhere where you can get to it. In order to control a smoke generator, which has a relatively high power draw, a smoke controller board is included and has been designed to work with the Revolution TE receiver. This smoke control board has been designed to be used by the auxiliary control harness to remotely operate smoke generators by acting as an electronic switch or relay. The smoke control board has the ability to operate two smoke generators simultaneously. One nice thing about this kit is it includes everything you need to install inside a non-Aristocraft locomotive. This adapter plug even includes some extra fuses. You use this plug to take your train engineer receiver and plug the 12 pin header into the board. You can then use the wires to wire into your current engine, the motor, the power, to make it run. You might think about using the pink foam that was shipped with your train engineer to protect the 10 pin header that's exposed on the other side. The last accessory in the box is the auxiliary control harness. This harness plugs into a seven pin auxiliary wiring connector at one end of the receiver board. The wires, which correspond to keys one through six on your transmitter, are connected to the control functions of your choice. You would connect these wires to your sound board to be able to use the horn or the bell or brake. You would also use it to connect to the smoke control board to turn your smoke on and off. And of course, there's the transmitter, and this is nicely designed. It feels great in your hand. It uses three 
double A batteries and it's so much easier to put the batteries in than on previous train engineer units. There's a simple door that slides off and then snaps right back on. A simple push of the on button, the screen lights up and you're ready to go. The transmitter can be divided into three areas. There's the LCD screen, which gives you the information on the receiver signal strength. You can put the loco name in there, get the current speed, the direction, and how your battery voltage is doing as well. There's a lot of information on this one screen, and it's easy to read and backlit as well. The second area is where there are arrow keys and the ability to activate different cabs. And that's the language they use, is that each engine is considered a cab, as if someone's actually sitting in it and driving it. You use the arrow keys to get around the menu screens. And at the bottom, you'll find a keypad. And the greatest part is, it's just like your cell phone. Now, I can't text message as fast as my 16-year-old, but it's easy for me to put in the loco's name and be able to access the menus using a keyboard that I'm already familiar with. I give two thumbs up on this idea. It works very, very well. So that's what's in the starter kit for the Aristocraft Train Engineer Revolution. It has everything that you need to install in one engine. And the best part is it doesn't have to be just an Aristocraft engine because it has everything you need to install in other engines as well. We'll be doing some additional videos showing you specifically how to install the product in different engines, so look for those at lsol.com. Bachman Industries has added a sixth car to its expanding fleet of highly detailed Spectrum 120.3 freight equipment. The latest offering is an American car and foundry side door low side gondola. The gondola is based on cars that were used by a number of western narrow gauge railroads to transport coal and various types of aggregate. The unit comes with an extra set of metal couplers and some detailed plastic parts that are very small in case you break or lose them on your model. There is also a plastic bag that includes your warranty information and a one-page exploded diagram of all the different parts that make up your gondola. The gondola scales out to be 30 feet in length over the end beams. It is 17 and 7 8 inches in length. 4 and 11 16 inches in width, 3 and 11 16 inches in height, and weighs 2 pounds 12 ounces. It's the same length as the Bachmann Spectrum boxcar and flat car. In fact, the gondola uses the flat car. They've added sideboards and additional details. The arch bar trucks are the same trucks that are used on the Spectrum boxcar and flat car. The trucks are sprung and equalized, and all truck parts are metal. Side frames are attached to the truck bolster with two small machine-threaded screws in each side frame. Probably the most interesting feature of this car would be the four doors on each side. They actually work. The latches work and will hold the door closed, however there's no mechanism to hold the door open. Be careful because they are fragile. The detailing of this unit is amazing. All the pieces are cast and clean, and there's even a working cut lever that will lift the knuckle pin and release your coupler. If you think the sides and ends are highly detailed, wait till you take a look at the bottom of the unit. In this bottom view of the gondola, it's easy to see the outside hung brake beams on the trucks. You'll be able to see the two coupler box screws are visible there are metal wheels on this unit, and it should also be noted that the car body truck bolsters are made out of metal as well. Take a look at this full view of the underbody. It shows the level of detail found in the framing and the brake rigging. Even the floorboard undersides are wood grained. 
There are working journal box lids that could be broken or lost when running. Even though there's extras, you might consider gluing them shut. On balance, Bachman has produced another highly detailed 120.3 car. Its wood grain detail is first rate. The metal items such as the proper sized grab irons, cut levers, brake wheel and staff, and strap steps are well executed. Paint finish is excellent. This gondola is well worth consideration when expanding your fleet of properly sized narrow gauge rolling stock. The Deloro Pacific Modular Railroad Club is one of the largest and oldest modular layouts in the world. Large-scale train modules have become one of the most popular attractions at public events. Their size and variety are very eye-catching and it holds people's interest for long periods of time. The Deloro Pacific Modular Railroad Club has created some of the most diverse, and detailed modular layouts for large-scale trains. There are always lots of trains running, a variety of different and interesting scenes with lots of action including sound effects, lights, and even smoke. One of the interesting parts of the Deloro Pacific modulars is that many of the scenes extend below the top of the table creating a truly three-dimensional effect. So sit back, relax, and enjoy your video tour of the Deloro Pacific Modular Railroad Club at this year's 2005 Big Train Show.
so the box went like this. And so what I did is I, I cut it out and took the other half of the box. And then these put some trim on it. And these are corbels for a regular. My name is Barry Ziegler, and, uh, and the railroad is basically a, a Pensy theme. I'm a I'm sort of a SP half a slobbering Pensy fan, and so uh, Don Sweet being here, he's from the New England area, so we have both Pennsylvania and New England. And does, does your railroad have a name? It doesn't really have a name, no. Actually, we started out the I wanted a pawn, and uh, my daughter got us a, a, a pawn for our anniversary. And so, uh, when, I, when I put the pond in, I wanted to put a waterfall in, and I wanted to put the railroad underneath the, the waterfall and around, and, and I didn't really have the money to get started at the time. So I said, well, well, we'll wait a couple years. So we waited a couple of years, and I got to be 60 years old, and I said to my wife, I said, you know, we're going we're gonna to put the pond in in the tunnel, and I'll just put a, a circle, a track around, and uh, then we'll go from there. And so... We did that at the beginning of the summer, and by the end of the summer, it pretty much looked like it does now, with, the, with few exceptions. And then we just, from that point on, just sort of put uh, a few extra switches in here and there, and, and extended the shed and things like that. Basically, it was this design from the word go, and uh, it just got there a long time before I thought it was going to. things that, that, I, that I did, did want to do when I, when I started this was uh, I did not want any electricity out here. I wanted battery power and I wanted air operated switches. And the, and the both of them have worked out really well for me. How many feet of track do you think there are here? Uh, there's over 800 foot. We have a 2% ele elevation uh, right here with, uh, with three curves on it. And so when we get, uh, we have a, uh, between Don and I, we have a 28 car stack train and uh, two dash nines and it puts quite a bind on it when it's coming up here. Matter of fact, we had to talk to uh, Sam at KD because we were stretching the couplers out on the engines. So Sam uh, said he was going to uh, modify the knuckle, the knuckle a little bit, make it just a little bit heavier that, so that it would, uh, would take that. Are the buildings scratch built or? Uh, some of them are and some of them are kits. The, the, the building that I have there was a scratch built building and I did that first and that's yeah. what has the switches in. I have all air, air operated okay. switches. And uh, this building was, was a gift. The guy was going to throw it away and I said, well, don't do that. I'll take that. So I, I took that from him. And the rest of them are, are a couple of kits and a couple of Aristocraft and a, and a scratch built station there.
So how long did it take you to build this? Well, the railroad's four years old. And when, when I started the railroad, I actually did this back to the end of the shed. But I thought that was going to be enough. Well, it, it obviously wasn't, so I had to put extensions on it. And then I never intended to go in the top either. But then we got to a point where we still didn't have, when Don came in here, then we still didn't have any room. And I, and I wanted to get these, these engines out of the house, out of, off of my waist counter. I mean, she's very tolerant after 34 years, but I know she would like to have her counter back. So. How, how long? How long is that long extension that goes all the way to the back? Well, it's 24 feet. So this is this is actually 18, and then there's another 24 foot up there. So you've got 100 feet of track just in the extension. Oh yeah. So there's a pretty good train sitting in there. air against them, they they push the switch. When you release the air, there's a five pound spring in there that pulls it back. And so the switch is always straight through when it's at rest. USA Trains has available its award-winning GP30 locomotive with matching rolling stock and caboose. All three items are painted with the same paint scheme as well as logos for the appropriate railroad. Let's start with the first part of this three-part set and that's the GP30 locomotive. It comes with a detailed instruction manual as well as all the parts that you can add to make this a very highly detailed model. Your GP30 comes with a variety of detailed parts. We found it was easy to group them as to the location they will be installed on the engine. And there's a variety of parts to install. There's a couple of lift bar assembly, some fold down steps, as well as an MU connector and air hoses. You'll also be installing handrails on both the front and the back of the unit, as well as both sides. Once you get it done, it makes the unit highly detailed and has a nice finished look. You'll also be attaching some truck side frame stirrups. You insert one truck side frame into each truck side frame, as we've shown. The handrails sometimes need a little bit of pressure to be added in, but just be very careful. And you may also want to use some type of cement to install them permanently. Once you've completed the handrails, the only thing that left to add is the smokestack. And once you've done that, your model is complete. 
Once you have all the detail parts added, your GP30 looks good and is ready to run. The USA Trains GP30 has many standard special features, including a lighted number board and an interior lighted cab. There's a detailed interior cab as well as an engineer. It has red and green directional marker lights. It also comes with multiple road numbers for running multiple units. Like other USA Trains products that we have looked at, this GP30 has crisp, clean paint lines as well as easy to read decals even when the printing is very very small. It also has rotating roof fans. The GP30 from USA Trains is just the first part of this three-part set. The second item we'll look at is a matching USA Trains 40-foot PS1 steel box car. It has the matching graphics and paint job to match your GP30 locomotive. Like the GP30 locomotive, the detailing on the paint and the paint schemes is excellent. The lines were crisp and the small text and characters are very easy to read. There are multiple road numbers available for most railroads so you can run multiple cars and not just have number 4321 coming right by every single time. There's three styles of operating doors depending on the type of boxcar that you get and they have an operating slide and a door latch that actually works. There are detailed Bettendorf trucks with metal wheels and a detailed underbody including a complete brake system. The unit is held together by eight long screws, so if you're thinking about using one of these as maybe a battery car or a sound car, it's easy to take apart and put back together. The details on this unit just don't stop. It has see-through roof walks and grates, as well as see-through end steps. There's even real chain on the brake assembly. The USA Trains come installed with the hook and loop coupler, but they also include the USA Trains knuckle coupler. One thing nice about the box cars is you can remove the truck and install a KD 830 coupler right in the pocket. Just three screws and you're done. The last piece to this puzzle is the USA Trains extended vision caboose. This unit is equipped with interior lighting as well as a flashing rear ETD light that can remain illuminated with a built-in rechargeable battery circuit. All you need to do is open the unit up and add the battery. This unit also is highly detailed using actual chain for the brake assembly. There's a switch that allows you to have the lights on or off or to have the flashing light on using the battery circuit when there is no track power. The unit is also highly detailed and has the detailed roof and walkways, metal handrails and ladders as well as metal wheels. It includes a detailed instruction manual that tells you how to install the battery for the circuit as well as the position of the switches and your maintenance and service. The unit ran great on our railroad. We found the GP30 in our test pulled many, many cars and produced a lot of smoke. This matching set just by itself looked great running on our railroad. We can't wait to add additional units to make it look even better.
Welcome to the Tortoise and Lizard Bash Railroad. The Tortoise and Lizard Bash was established in 1997 in order to give the gophers something else to tear up other than the lawn. We had a real bad gopher problem and they kept destroying our lawn and we thought that it would be nice to let them destroy something else. We were up in Sac Sacramento at the Railroad Museum and we went to the All-American Train Store and we saw the Garden Railroad books and the LGB trains. Well, I said to Linda, wouldn't that be cool to let the gophers tear something like that up rather than the lawn all the time? Linda agreed, but thought it would be a lot of work. She says, I'll let you have the railroad, but you gotta do everything, including all of the weeding. Groundbreaking occurred in April of 1997 and the first train was run in October the same year. 90% tr of the track was in in six months time and the trains were running. That included a month to build the control panel alone. The plants came later. Originally, small patches of plants were planted as ground cover. Miniature trees were purchased from the various establishments such as Miniature Plant Kingdom, Upland Nursery. We did not want a conifer forest. We're not modeling conifers, so the peak of the waka were not for us. A lot of people like them. We didn't care for them. We're modeling a deciduous forest in California. The Tortoise and Lizard Bash Railroad covers approximately 1,200 square feet of area. There's 550 feet of Aristocraft track and 19 turnouts, both Aristocraft and LGB. Turnouts operate automatically off a remote control system or can be manually thrown if operations are desired. The railroad was originally designed for operations and three people can operate it at one time. There's 23 blocks and each one is addressable by three different cab controls. All cab controls work by radio control track power, either train engineer or RCS systems.
The Tortoise and Lizard Bash is designed to be run at night. There's approximately 36 buildings and structures, all of which have night lighting. Additionally, there are lights placed all around the railroad and small lanterns held by miniature figures on barrels, etc., such as to light up things of interest. All the waterfalls are backlit and the volcanoes use both intricate lighting systems and misting units to obtain a true volcano-like effect. This is the Eagle Pass Railroad and it started back in 96 uh, so it's been here a while I keep adding stuff to it all the time. I try to use a lot of different products and a lot of imagination. A lot of my buildings are jigstone, some are polo kits, some are made out of uh, backer board and all different kinds of material that I can find and that I uh, think might be of some use. A lot of buildings are lit for night uh, running. Uh, there's over 100 buildings out here and all over 100 little lights. <laughs> How did you start off? Did you start off with this inner loop? Uh, right. And that was your first thing yeah. and then you just started adding out? Yeah, the first loop uh, started in 96 with a, a pile of dirt from uh, somebody digging a swimming pool nearby. And it just uh, continued out and farther and farther and farther. And eventually I intend to have uh, another run, run across the back wall. But I'm thinking maybe I'm going to redo some of the lower stuff this year, too. So, uh, combined uh, total footage, how, how many total feet of uh, track? Right now we're have? running over 800 feet. You mean like the not so green ranch and not so green acres ranch and the uh, A1 medical center and of course the nursery and the adopt a pet um, place there for uh, where you can get a dog. You know? <laughs> and if you look closely, you'll see some people in there buying pets. Um, and the, of course, the Pola nursery, uh, which is uh, one of my pride and joys. That was a job putting that in together. Um, I have an Walmart, firehouse, and um, a city hall and a school, which also are built out of cinder blocks. There's been a renovation of uh, almost all the trees on this layout have been replaced within the last year. And the trees that you use are artificial. These so are all artificial, to, yeah. Don't have to worry about water. Yeah, or right. Like that. We don't get much rain or anything out here, so, um, you know, it's a pain trying to water anything that's live out here. But it all runs on track power. I could also run live steam, which I have a live steam engine, and uh, battery power trains. And we have a nice patio in the center there, which we can enjoy the view over the wall. What view there is over the wall. <laughs> Thank you. 
In the Bachman 2006 catalog, it says, third time's the charm, and our first impression of this new three-truck Shea indicates that Bachman called it right. You will find that the three-truck Shea is just about identical to the previous versions from the front pilot to the back of the cab. All of the action on a Shea happens on the right side. It's amazing to see the piston rods attached to the crankshaft, which is attached to the drive shaft that extend to the gearbox to the outside of each wheel. The side opposite the cylinder is sometimes called the wrong side, or at least that's what the inner circle of Shea enthusiasts term it. The unit has many nice details that add to the finished look of the product. Don't put any water in the back there because that's where your sound system is. The unit side windows open and close, as well as the front windows opening and closing on both sides of the unit. The front of the unit has a full-size working coupler. Opening the smoke box door will reveal two switches. The top one is for the motor and the bottom one is for the smoke unit. The roof vent also opens and is held in place with a sawtooth prop. At the rear of the tank are mounted the sander boxes, ladder, and backup light. Take note that the coupler is made of metal and not plastic. The inside of the cab is very detailed. The firebox includes a flickering red LED. Connecting the tank to the engine is a three-step process. There is a single multi-plug that plugs into the bottom of the tank. There is a draw bar with a hole and pin that needs to be attached. And then you must connect the two drive pieces together. The unit includes quite a variety of detailed items like track tools, a toolbox. It also includes a video containing the history of the Shea, as well as hook and loop couplers. There are two figures included, a fireman and an engineer. Our Bachman Shea included sound, so let's sit back, relax, and let's watch the Bachman Shea in action.
little bit about the, uh, the Sundance Central Modular uh, Layout Group. When we first started this, what we wanted to do is to create in large scale something that we hadn't seen before, honestly, which was a highly detailed, consistent thematic layout. And uh, with, uh, we're really shooting for a museum quality kind of presentation. And so that was our intent from the beginning. It sort of came from, I guess, at first we were looking at, uh, you know, Frank, one of our members, uh, had observed that there wasn't anything like this in large scale. Certainly we've seen some fabulous layouts in smaller scales. And going to several train shows and, uh, and being involved in clubs, we saw there was an opportunity and a need for this, we thought. And so uh, Frank had envisioned a small sort of, uh, I guess, diorama at first, which got a little bit bigger and Richard got involved. Then we started designing a layout and it was like the circus. It kept growing, it got bigger. And so uh, that's how this whole thing came about. And, you know, over the past, I guess, three and a half years that we put this together, you know, we've, it's really evolved in terms of just from a tabletop to uh, pretty highly detailed scenery. You know, we keep improving things. We keep upgrading the rolling stock and our scenery, et cetera, and building detail into the scenes. We've added the backdrops. We've added, you know, high intensity lighting to bring out the details. And so it's, it seems to have worked well, okay, in that sense. We've sort of figured out where we are in the space um, we were happy to go to the narrow gauge convention and win the best modular in our first year there. That made us uh, feel as though we were legitimate, okay, in that sense. Um, and the feedback we're getting now is very positive. And there's a lot of work, as you might imagine, and money invested in this venture. But it's nice when you come to a show and people say, you know, this is a work of art or, you know, this is, this is uh, a tremendous layout. So that makes us feel good. Uh, my name is Frank Palmer. I'm from Hudson, Florida, and I'm one of the members of the Sundance Central. It's an eight-member group. Uh, we're all generally from the Tampa Bay area. One of the things that we've been able to accomplish is to getting the high level of detail into our buildings. And one of the things that we wanted to create in this layout was the uh, bridges and the trestles. So we constructed two bridges and trestle sections that are approximately 15 feet long and 28 to 30 inches high. They're uh, constructed out of cedar, uh, sawn down on a uh, table saw, and put together with bolts, rivets, and screws, and try to get the ability to take it apart and put it back together, but still have the strength and reliability to run expensive, heavyweight trains on. The trains are acu most of our trains are AccuCraft, uh, which weigh anywhere from 20 to 25 pounds. So we needed the strength to, uh, for those uh, trains to run over. And one of the other things of pretty interest is the many trees that we have on the layout being made from a bottle brush look using rope fibers spun around wire with a twisting effect to it which gives it the bottle brush look. Other trees are made from air conditioner filters with the ground foam sprinkled on them. Others are from uh, branches that we've collected and uh, some of them are uh, sage brush and over that we've stretched uh, steel wool and then on the steel wool we've sprinkled uh, the ground foam again so we have quite a few types of trees on the layout some are made from Ming fern which is a natural product probably in the neighborhood of three to four hundred trees on the layout but it still looks kind of sparse when you look at it
the many different modules here. Um, is each person responsible for a specific module? Like there was a module down here with the coke building and stuff. So one person has decorated and, and done that and they're responsible for that design? Right. Uh, each one of us in the group, like I said, there was eight members. We, we have anywhere from two to five modules. So we basically take care of our own stuff, but then we do get together and set it up maybe once or twice a year. And we try to give the weathering a once over to make it all continuous. And we also kind of encourage each other to create different effects or buildings or structures along the line. And that way we kind of all get together and one person will say, well, I'm going to build some, you know, a gas station or the slum area. And we say, well, if you do this and if you do that, and it kind of gets, gets the, the creative juices flowing. So therefore you kind of have your own idea, but yet the all of us kind of contribute into the idea to make it a little better. And by doing that, you know, you get so much more out of it because you don't just using your own thoughts, you're using the combination of the eight of us to come up with some kind of a creative idea. On the layout, I noticed that you have a, a lightning, a thunder. Exactly how did you put that together? But Keith Wolf is the one that's uh, mainly in charge of our lightning, thunder, and lighting effects. He's come up with the different sound modules for lightning and thunder. We have one for a banjo player, and then there's a sawmill and waterfall sounds. And then the, some, we couple in with the lightning and thunder, we couple in with the overhead lights going off and then the strobe lights coming on, which kind of gives you the, it gets dark and then you get the flashes of lightning. And then it's on a, like about a two minute cycle and then it, uh, you gets quiet and then all of a sudden maybe those people move on and then you get a fresh new batch of people looking at it and then the thunder comes on again. Out of the 22 modules, there's approximately 115 feet on each main line. So with the two main lines, we've got about 230 feet. We've hand laid Lagos Creek Aluminum Code 250 rail with uh, Hartford Products tie plates onto our own hand cut railroad ties. It's all been glued down onto a two inch thick foam insulation deck. That currently we just have one siding with about six feet of siding. And the inside radius curves are five and a half feet. The outside radius curves are six feet radius. Once you get something like this going, it's hard to stop. And you just keep building and improving and you know, pretty much, I think everything is up to standard. We have consistency among all 22 modules, which was something that is unique about this at a period time and a consistent look to all of our scenery. And you can go all the way around the layout and see all the different scenes, but you get the impression there's a master plan and everybody works together as a team. And uh, that's how we produce the finished product, if it's ever finished, which it never will be. <laughs>
we used a uh, landscaping uh, mesh. It's a plastic mesh. It's got like half inch square holes in it. And we shaped the sides of the hills with that, tacked it in place. And on top of that, we spread uh, mortar. And while the mortar was still wet, we pressed uh, wrinkled aluminum foil against the mortar and let that sit and dry and then uh, peeled the aluminum foil off the uh, mortar uh, 24 hours later at least. Uh, we did, uh, prior to uh, putting the aluminum foil on the wall, we uh, coated the aluminum foil with uh, uh, vegetable oil, ham, something like that, non-stick, so that it doesn't, didn't adhere to the, the uh, mortar. The advantage is you're not really mixing cement, you're just carrying the bags once, putting them in place. And then, then you mix up a batch and, and, and just spread it on uh, onto the uh, landscape mesh. And then uh, when it dries, it it's all uh, has the rocky effect already. And, what kind and of all paint? you do is paint. It's what a, kind of paint did you use? It's a Krylon spray paint we get at the oh. hardware store. There are three, okay. three different shades on here. There's a, there's a brown, there's a gray, and there's something that almost looks yellowish. It's very light tan. And the combination of the three give it a re very realistic effect. Paint fades and, and uh, uh, over the last couple of winters we had some pieces of the rock just break off from the freezing and thawing and uh, we just paint right over it again. So every, every year it gets, uh, parts of it get a fresh paint job. But, uh, How long has this been out here? Uh, these walls have been out here through two winters now. Uh, they were installed in the summer of 2003, and, and they've been through So two, the only two thing winters. supporting the track there, and then, is the cement bag mixture underneath. Yeah, and, underneath. And, and, and we shaped the top of, of the, the hill so we could, we could put the ballast in under the track. So it's, it's like in a cup at, at the top. The Susquehanna Valley Garden Railway Society was formed in May 1994 and has grown to over 100 members. The SVGRS is an informal organization which meets bi-monthly at members' homes or at the new Oxford train station. The SVGRS is a family-oriented group. They attend train shows, have clinics for their members, provide a newsletter, and have an annual picnic and Christmas party. Uh, my name's Jake Midair. I'm a member of the Susquehanna Railway Train Club. Uh, uh, I built the sawmill from scratch. The sawmill is mainly made out of fence board. Not really done from any plan. It's really done out of my head. I looked at some books uh, some of the club members had of old mills and just took it from there. The main goal in this mill here, my second time around, is to have the logs come out of the pond conveyor to wash off the logs like they had back then and it just just kind of amplified just goes from there once you do something it just evolves into something else so it's a remote control it has 12 relays involved remote control uh, we switched the whole control is 
based on 12 volts DC. Mainly it's uh, mostly relays, done with relays. Well, my name's Mike Oberdick. I'm from the Susquehanna Valley Garden Railway Society in York, Pennsylvania. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the bridge, what kind of bridge it is, and uh, how it operates. Well, I saw a picture on a postcard of one from England, and I never saw a real one, but I thought it'd be a nice bridge to make, so it's as close as I could figure to the picture I saw. It's operated with an electric drill, to gear reduction and a chain drive. Instead of using the battery, I have off a power pack and then it goes to gear reduction and then chain sprockets, chain driven sprockets. Uh, and then the it's a series of pulleys that actually lift the bridge. And the catter balances on the side uh, actually operate to help the bridge go up and down? Right, that helps the, the motor so it don't strain that. And how much do each one of those uh, counterbalances weigh? Well, they only weigh three pounds. A piece. The bridge, the bridge itself weighs about 35 pounds. And what is the bridge made out of it, and how did you put it together? Uh, the bridge is made here by some man in New York, and, uh, and the rest of the stuff I bought at Lowe's. It's a uh, square tubing with holes punched in, and it's all bolted. My name is Steve Hughes, and my railroad, I call it the Spokane Division of the Southern Pacific Railroad. It's a mythical extension of the Southern Pacific out of Portland to Spokane with trackage rights on the Union Pacific, the Great Northern, and the Milwaukee Road. I've been in garden railroading since 1989. That's when I was in California, where I'm originally from, and we knew we were gonna move up to Spokane, where we live, and have property for my wife's horses, and I needed property for the trains. And so that's how I got it started into garden railroading. Prior to that, I had been in model railroading since I was five years old. That's over 50 years ago, in O-Gage and H-O. But as I got older and the eyes get worse, garden railroading was the way to go. Okay, first of all, on the track, uh, it's all floating roadbed. This was all built 
by first of all digging about a four to five inch deep trench all the way around and I put in a grass protection cover to keep the weed, weed block covering in place. Then I laid in two by eight by 16 paving stones under heavy gravel. Then I lifted the track on little half inch square shims and I placed a finer gravel underneath all the way around and blended it in to hence have my floating road bed. Just like a real railroad, I have heaves and, and dips every year which I have to work on to keep it level and I re-ballast the entire line every spring. Now the tunnel took me approximately six weeks to build and inside is a combination of two by eight by sixteen paving stones and your wall block that would be reinforced by concrete. There are over sixty of those type of stones within. The outside is made of a basalt rock which a friend of mine picked up along the road out near Davenport and much of the rest was contributed. So between that it took six weeks it was my wife was the one that really had it so that looked more like a realistic rock slope and some, instead of some boring dull thing. And she is the one I credit for all the plants, as you see here on the rocks and of course in the layout itself. The trains themselves, I run a variety of USA, Aristocrat, and LGB, uh, modern basically, mainline steam and diesel from the early 50s up to the present time. The freight cars are a variety again of LGB, USA, and Aristocrat mixed up at 129th scale. The passenger train is Southern Pacific, that's all USA passenger cars and uh, the the PAs are also USA. The couplers are all body-mounted KDG scale type couplers. They're the most reliable and they hold together the best. Uh, also allows me to pull very long trains should I want to. Now, my railroad, I've had it in the ground here since we've lived up here since 1993. I've had it in the ground for over 11 years. The inner loop, as you see it now, is the original loop that was completed in 1995. The outer loop that goes to the tunnel was completed in 1996. Now the extension in which the, you've seen the daylight go up and through on was not built until approximately three years ago when it was completed. Now that is almost all solid rock and a two and a half percent grade going up there. I call the grade going up a little quest to grade like Quested grade out of San Luis Obispo, California. The loop going under it I call my little Tehachapi loop because this is Southern Pacific Railroad and those two grades are very famous for the railroad. Now the track I use is a combination of Aristocrat and LGB, whatever I could get at the time. The original inner, what is now the inner loop, the, which was the original loop, when I built it it, so it was approximately, and still is, a little over 200 feet in length. I originally started by using 10 foot uh, diameter curves, but that's all been changed. It's a combination now of uh, 14 and 15, uh, 14 foot Aristo and 15 and foot uh, LGB curve track for the inner loop. The outer loop, which I built a year later, as I previously explained, is all 20 foot Aristo a di diameter track. Now the switches I use are all LGB, the 1800 model switches, the wide radius switches. Um, I power directly to the track. I use a 16-2 wire. I just converted over from a very complex panel which gave me nothing but grief. I have straight power from two LGB jumbos, one to the inner loop, one to the outer loop and it works, has worked very smoothly. As far as the connections, I use all Hillman clamps. I use another type of clamp which I won't mention, but it gave me nothing but grief. The Hillmans are very, very reliable. And I use LGB insulators between the, the two loops. The spurs and the through switches, I have 
individual, those are on-off power. I used to do a direct power from the panel, but again, I had problems, so now it's just easier to use the KISS system. As you might know, KISS keep it simple stupid, and I just went to on and off throw switches to each uh, spur. As far as future growth plans, uh, I probably got as big as I am now, but I'm going to add some additional spurs. I've got a stump track near one of the warehouses, and that's going to be for a future engine house, which I have a kit I'll be building, and I'll be putting in an oil storage site with uh, the uh, loading docks and oil storage tanks.